Yeah, well, thank you for being here. Really good to see such a, a large crowd of people. We're really lucky in Wales to have all this support, which we don't get in England. Uh, just out of interest, just to gauge who we've got here, how many of you are actually active growers? Just about everybody. Brilliant. And the best time to be sorting out crop plans is now, between now and January. You know, it's quite a short window of opportunity because um, as growers, you, you probably kind of think, oh, winter's here and we don't have to do too much for a while. That's not true. You're actually quite busy in the winter. So this is my definition of what a crop plan is really about. Um, a plan of crops within a rotation, and this is an important point, within a rotation to cater for a specific market. You know, your market's going to dictate what you grow. Contain information to allow the correct number of plants to raise and the seeds to sow and the timing to achieve optimal cropping. So it's a plan, it's a crop plan. And this gives us all the information we need in order to make sure we, we sow and plant at the right time. But importantly, it means that we have the seed at the right time to go ahead and get plants raised. So you need to look at the whole system. So it's a natural system of biological interaction between all the different forces. We've got fungi, we've got bacteria, we've got insects, we've got mammals. We've got plant growth, we've got flora and fauna. All these things are part and parcel of the same thing, all completely interdependent on each other. That starts, the minute you walk into the farm, through the farm gate, it starts from that point. The hedges, the field boundaries, the soil, the biodiversity, the local flora and fauna. All this is part of your system, which needs to be managed in a very specific way. Carrots, for example, don't really need very much nitrogen, but they need a lot more potash and phosphate. Right, what do you do about slugs? Well, it's not like, oh, we do so-and-so. It's not that simple. It's about the way you manage the system. But there is a nematode which is used for slug control. It works. It kills slugs. It works really well. In fact, it works too well because what happens, it dries, it kills the slugs. It, then the predators of the slugs, the ground beetles and all the various things that live on slugs disappear. Slugs come back, of course. Um, and they come back and there's, there's almost no predators to control them. So the problem gets bigger. So you put more nematode slug on. Uncovered soil is the best way of losing, firstly, your fertility, because it will literally wash away, particularly in the winter when you get heavy rains. It damages the soil flora and fauna, but particularly fauna. It damages the biological function of the soil. Microbes do not like being exposed to wind, sun or rain. I look at four W's, so four W's. Weeds, wireworm. Did you have wireworm? You have wireworm, wire right? Yeah, yeah. Weed, wireworm, water, either too much because it's badly drained or not enough because you have no tap, and wabbits. <laughs> right? Because they're the four main, and then you could say it's a fifth one, weather. Potatoes are really good at suppressing weed, brassicas are good, carrots are not so good. If you keep growing weed susceptible crops, you will build up a big weed problem. There's nothing wrong with weeds. Weeds are absolutely essential to your system because weeds contain a whole range of fungi and bacteria in their roots, which are an important part of soil function. You cannot ever continue to crop land every single year without a break. It's impossible. You have to have a break. It might be quite short. It depends on the quality of your land. It depends on the crops you grow. You have to have a break. You cannot continue to cultivate forever. The best way of building fertility is through plants, is through roots. Root, the, the structure of roots in undisturbed soil is the best way of restoring fertility. We don't use any fertilisers, we don't use any inputs at all to the farm, other than wood chip, most of them grow, and green manures, and we've been able to make fertility over, over three and a half decades without any inputs at all, and it's primarily due to the function of the green manures interacting, improving, allowing the natural biology of the soil to, to, to flourish. We've got huge numbers of biological activity going on. Plants behave every bit the same way that we behave. If you want to think about what treatment a plant needs, think about how you want to be treated. So there's loads of, there's loads of legumes. However, if you were to grow a crop of French beans and harvest it and take the pods away, is that a legumes break crop? No, why not? So it's a break crop when you take it back in. Yeah. If you, take, if you take the seed from a crop, um, particularly beans, you, you're actually taking a lot of fertility away, particularly you know, some nutrient, phosphate and potash. Um, and the nitrogen, everyone thinks that beans produce nitrogen, and they do, 
but only if you leave the crop in the ground and you desiccate it and you allow it to die naturally, you don't take anything away. If we all go down to the Heritage Centre, and we're going to try and go in as few cars that we can, and then we're going to go up to Kai Tam then um, for a short visit to have a look at this. And we've got two sites. We've grown for like 130 households through the CSA. Um, we grow all year round, so we're storing some stuff and have a lot of stuff in the ground all year. The other thing about cooch I didn't mention is, is having a no man's land. I call it no man's land. Where does the cooch come from? Here, the headlands. It comes from the headlands. And every time you get a tractor, you turn around, you pick up a bit of cooch, you drag it halfway down the field, leave it somewhere, that's how it gets established. So we have a, a two metre strip all the way around the end of our rows, and we're ridging up, so all our crops are on ridges, which again is also quite good for controlling cooch because if it is in the ridge, when you lift the crop, potatoes or carrots or whatever, you take that cooch out. If you crop cover, you can get a big problem with pests. Right. You know, unless you keep them covered the whole year round, but then you're going to get aphid problems. And how about the carrots? Do you cover those? Yeah, we cover fly? carrots from early August. I mean, the carrot fly for us is nearly all year round though. Okay. You know, we used to be able to avoid it, by yeah. sowing late, but that's not working so well. So we're sowing, our last sowing is first week in July, and they're, they're covered now for the winter. Okay. Uh, we've just harvested the last of the early sowing. We've had a bit of carrot fly coming in just last week, because okay. they weren't covered at all. And they were May sowing. But you've got, yeah. a nice, you've got a nice weed cover here. And when you cultivate down that end of the field, you know, it feels like it's like knackering the machinery. What's knocking them back? Is it the cultivating? It's the cultivation. Or is it yeah. And a lack of grass. It's getting weedy in places, I kind of... Yeah, well, that's because you're not turning it enough. Okay. We turn four times a year. Yeah. So four times during its life. Yeah. That keeps the weeds down. I mean, we, we get fantastic crops of squash, like you do. Yeah. As late as possible. Yeah, we so do as well. We we've just finished two varieties. And the third one is... Compared with large-scale potato growers, that's nothing. They put on five times that amount, you know? So, I mean, that amount of water would be worth about 2,000 pounds. Allowing that to get too low means that you end up putting a huge amount on. So we tend to put regular amounts on to keep it up. So typical rates, 30 mil, spuds down to 10 for root crops, lettuce if demanding, um, heavier soils you can get away with possibly a lot less. And that's the end, thank you. Uh, <laughs> bang on time, yeah? <laughs>